So we're here today on a nice fall day in October of 2022 with Dr. Brendan Neary to talk about your career in obstetrics and gynecology. So let's start at the beginning. Yes, sir. What drew you to medicine? What, what was your story that got you into medicine? Well, like many things in my life, it was a completely unplanned surprise. And uh, I'm here on account of a mentor that took an interest in me when I was in college. I grew up in Lowell, very lower class. Uh, my mother did go to college, but no one else in the family did. And I was of the opinion that people like me did not go any higher than a bachelor's degree. I thought that was my goal, that would be my lot in life. But um, one of my professors, my biochemistry professor, took an interest in me, and he encouraged me to shoot a little bit higher and encouraged me to apply to graduate school and or medical school. So where'd you I go did. to college? I went to the University of Lowell. At the time, it was, was it Lowell? It was Lowell State. And you majored in? I majored in biology. Biology. So you're interested in... I was interested in life sciences, yes. yes. <laughs> but again, I started off as a language major. I, I majored in French and Spanish in the arts huh. and made a switch when I realized I'm not going to make a living this way. But mm. I don't regret Smart that. Smart move. Smart move, yes, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So I moved, to bio, I moved to biology and then to biochemistry, which interestingly can be considered the Latin of the sciences. So in a way, it is a language. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And, and so you were encouraged by your chemistry yes, professor yes. to go to something a little bit higher something to pursue this. Something a little this. bit higher. Yes, right. exactly right. And then? Well, I applied to graduate school and was admitted into the Tufts Graduate School of Biomedical Science uh -huh. in, biochem in biochemistry. I was terrified. But it was there in my first year that I learned that I really had, I could swim with a big fish. Mm -hmm. I, it was okay. I could, I could, manage, the, I could manage the work. Um, I had the brain power. I didn't have the panache. I didn't have the, the, the polish or the language, but I did have the brain power. Mm -hmm. So I got, a, I got myself a doctorate in biochemistry, but realized over time that I really did not like the bench work. I, I, it was isolating. And I wanted something more interactive. Mm -hmm. So I got an MD, PhD the hard way. I got the PhD first, then I went to medical school. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you went to which medical school? I went to UMass Medical School. Mm -hmm. Here it, in Worcester. Here yeah. in Worcester. It was exceedingly inexpensive, and in many ways it was my only option because it was so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And at, at that time they had the learning contract which meant as a resident of Massachusetts, if I agreed to practice in Massachusetts for one year, there was a huge tuition waiver. Do you know if they still have that? I don't know if they still have it. I, huh. I don't think it's there in the form I experienced it. But yeah. no, I really don't know if they still have that. They probably don't. Okay, well, uh, so you went to UMass Med School. I went to UMass Med School, yes. And um, how big was your class then? My class was approximately 100 students, mm -hmm. probably, I think, a relatively equal mix of men and women. And so you two years of uh, basic sciences, two years of clinical. clinical. So you went into this with a head start on the basic science piece. I did have a head start on the basic science piece, particularly in the subject of biochemistry which kills people. It's, it's the real choke course. Right. Um, and as I said, I learned quickly that it was the Latin of the sciences. It made it easier to understand a lot of the things that I was learning de novo, like physiology, for example. Um, and in addition to that, I was hired to tutor my classmates. Yes. So I made a little bit of extra money, and that yes. was nice, too. Nice, nice. Yes. And uh, the clinical years. Yes. How did that go? What, uh, what was your life like? How many hours did it take? What were your experiences in the different uh, clerk trips? Yes, um, the, the, um, this was back at the time where there was never any attempt to restrict hours of doctors in training. And basically in the clinical years we functioned as house officers, full 
night call schedule, staying in the hospital. Um, work week would be maybe 80 hours or so, mm -hmm. a little less than what a full resident would get. Um, but pretty much in the hospital, doing all of the work as a house officer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. And uh, clerkships, how did that go? Clerkships, again, um, I wound up in the specialty that I'm in as a complete surprise. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I started off with um, internal medicine because I was sure that was where I was going to wind up and something mm -hmm. to do with internal medicine. And I saved obstetrics and gynecology for the very last clerkship of my third year because I was sure I would have no interest in it. Mm -hmm. And then when I went through that clerkship, within a week, I, real, I got bitten by the bug. <laughs> uh -huh. I remember, remember good old Dr. Kirkendall. Oh yeah. God bless him. He let me deliver a baby and it was the best thing in my life. It's his fault I'm here. Yeah. And I loved him as a mentor. Uh, he was very personable. Oh, he was yeah. personable. Yeah. Um, he was human. He, he was like my old uncle. Mm -hmm. And he made me feel comfortable. He made me feel like I could do this specialty. Yes. Yeah. Loved him to death. Yeah. And um, because of him, and also because of the house officers that I worked with, um, who inspired me, and um, I really clicked with, I wound up in this specialty as a complete surprise. Mm -hmm. Great. And so by and large, a positive experience in medical school. Lo I love med school. Yeah. I'd love to go to med school again. Yeah. I really would, yeah. especially now that I know what to learn. Yeah. I would love to go back and learn it all over again. Plus everything has changed. There has been so oh. much. Yeah. So many things are and different. Genetics, immunology. Genetics, analysis. immunology, genetics in particular. Yeah. And that has really changed everything. Yeah. Wow. As you know. So your residency, let's talk about that. My residency. Um, I matched here at UMass. It was my first choice, uh, largely because of the people that I worked with. Sure. I loved every minute of it. Uh -huh. I, I actually think that it's not normal to be happy in your residency. Mm -hmm. I think you should like it. And I did. And it was hard. And um, there were tears. But that's true of everything. I felt very well supported. Yeah. I had great teachers. And I also recognized that there were teachers that weren't so great. Yeah. And I learned from them to not be that way. I made a personal vow to myself that I would never be abusive to a, a, a student or a yeah. resident. And I hope that I have carried that through. Mm -hmm. And uh, hours during your residency, the hours, challenges, do you remember any particular cases that stick out that you remember from your residency? Oh, yes. Yeah, there were, there were a few. Um, I remember patients who died in particular, mm -hmm. uh, in particular the oncology patients. Sure. Back in the day, they were admitted for their chemotherapy and they would spend a week or two in the hospital. So I got to know them and you'd play cards with them. You'd socialize with them. And um, when they passed, it was, you grieved. And mm -hmm. I remember one young lady in particular she was in her early 40s, and she passed due to an aggressive cervical cancer. And she had bled to death the night before I came, before I came back to work. And I remember hearing the story, and I just was so affected. I couldn't, oh, yeah. yeah, I was very emotional about that, about so her passing. So this is interesting. Do you, do you think... Uh, that your approach to patients was the same as your fellow residents and attendants? In the circle Were they playing I, cards with their patients? Well, not the atten the attendings weren't. Yeah. But some of the residents were. Yeah. We loved them. Yeah. And some of the attendings, they didn't play cards with them. Yeah. But they, they hung around a very long time. With, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe that's not good either. But they had interpersonal relationships with these patients. And... Um, they ba you could tell that there was real compassion and caring about them, mm -hmm. about these people. And uh, I don't know, I, maybe I learned that from them. 
So just to circle around to this a little bit, because yeah. I think it's interesting. And that is, um, you spent more time with your patients than you had. I spent you more, were yes. A, you were in a situation yes. in which you were working exhausting hours. I you was, were yes. working burnout hours. We yes. were told today yes. that 25% or more of residents test positive for burnout on psychological exams by the time they finish their residency. I can totally believe that. And so I need to back up and say to myself, you don't sound like you were burned out. I was not then. Okay. I was not burned out at that time. Do you think that this approach to your patients had anything to do with it? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I think more it hours. More hours, but more rewarding hours. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. And I could tell it was good for the patients, too. Yeah. So it lifted, it lifted us both, yeah. as opposed to going into my little call room, which yeah. in virtually all cases, as you well know, is about the size of a jail cell. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. No windows. Maybe a little smaller. Maybe yeah. a little bit smaller. Yeah. That was solitary confinement for me. Yeah. I didn't care for that. Yeah. And so it wasn't good for me. And Did you feel any guilt or remorse about losing time outside of your residency, of sort of losing part of your life outside of residency? At the time, I did not think of it. Okay. I was single at the time. Yep. I was younger at the time. Yep. The concept of finite life did not yet register with me. But you were older than the average. I was older than the average bear, as it were. Uh, to use an old analogy, yeah. um, but I was still young enough that I had no thought of my parents passing away. Yeah. I had no thought of sickness or dying. Yeah. Time was still infinite for me. And so you finished your residency. You decided to go into general OBGYN and not subspecialized. Yes, I did. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, one of the reasons, there are a couple of reasons for it. Um, first of all, as you mentioned, I was older. Mm -hmm. I'd had enough school. Mm -hmm. I'd really had enough education, and I wanted to get out there and practice. Mm -hmm. The other thing was um, I felt that being a jack-of-all-trades within my specialty was the best way for me to go. It mm -hmm. was in line with my personality, um, and it would allow me to have a good mix of medicine and surgery mm -hmm. and patient continuity. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I chose. Okay. And um, you joined Dr. Hunter? I, first, yes, first I was on faculty at UMass for a few years. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, I was approached by the chairman of the department at that time and enrolled to get the faculty, to be on the faculty. I did that for probably four years. Mm hmm and there I wasn't particularly happy because I was giving my cases away to residents. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I kind of wanted to keep my hands in yeah. the mix, so to speak. Yeah. So I moved over to private practice and joined Dr. Hunter's group after so a few years. So compare and contrast life in the faculty versus life here in private practice. Very different. Yeah. Life, yeah. In, life in private practice was hugely different. Yeah. Um, first of all, the volume was much higher. Mm -hmm. I asked for that. I, I can't say I minded that per se. Um, the other thing was I had to do more things. The residents were doing were not doing everything for me. And again, I asked for that. Mm -hmm. The third part that I had no preparation for was the business aspect of mm -hmm. the practice. Mother of God, mm -hmm. that I really had no training for and just was, and still to this day, I'm somewhat resistant to learning that aspect of it. But still within your office here, yes. even if the duties for the administration have been delegated, yes. they are being delegated to someone who answers to you. That is correct, yes. At the university, they were being delegated to someone who answers to somebody else. That's exactly right, yes. Yeah, there was lack of control. Do you feel that difference here? Absolutely. Yes, we have much more control over the things that, that we do here. And mm -hmm. again, that's very much in line with the way I like to deliver care. We like to, both Dr. Hunter and I, 
we like to deliver just a touch of TLC, which yeah. we could not do in a university setting. Do you think there's anything within the personality that seeks uh, a career in medicine that has a particular value to autonomy? Or uh, how important is autonomy to you? It's up there. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's important for me to be able to make decisions yeah. and to be able to carry them through yeah. at least a majority of the time, maybe yeah. not all of the time. Yeah. But I think that's, that's important for both of us. And yeah. that's one of the reasons that we broke away. We were employed by the university, you remember. Okay. And that ended, that ended in 2000. Mm -hmm. We had a larger practice which split mm -hmm. and part of the folks went their way. They mm -hmm. were still with the university. They eventually mm -hmm. left and then Todd and I went off yeah. on our own. Yes. Yeah. And in these, so in private practice back, you know, when you were sort of full blown OBGYN. Yes. I imagine you've slowed down some. Oh, recently. yes, I have. But in the full blown spot, what sort of volume were we talking about as far as visits a day or deliveries a year or something like that? Yeah, uh, one year I had, this was a long time ago, one year I, I had 200 obstetrical patients. Sure. That's kind of high for yeah. my time. The time. Yeah, kind of big. Um, and it was busy. There were days where I would have 30 patients in a half, in a session, sure. like in a half day. Sure. It was hectic. Um, but it was different then. A, a patient's expected less then, mm -hmm. and um, it, we kind of, it was easier to, to manage that volume. Um, so that was different too. Yeah. yeah, I would say the intensity of prenatal care has increased quite a bit. That's, you, you speak it beautifully. You, you, so you phrase it perfectly. Yes, the intensity has increased. The patient population has increased. Yeah. Um, they are more educated. They require more time. And so you can't see those 30 patients anymore because there are more questions. Right. More can be done, and I would say patients expect that everything be done. That is exactly right. And, um, you know, there was a time in the 70s and 80s where there was a natural childbirth movement. People were pushing towards minimizing interventions, minimizing uh, the medicalization. And I think that at least my observation over the years was, was that the trend was much more towards the medicalization with more testing. Um, and uh, uh, as a result, a, a also an increased need for your presence in labor. Um, there was a time in a generation before mine where the nurse would call the doctor when the baby was ready to deliver. And uh, certainly during my career, that changed markedly. It, it was you know, many hours with each patient for, from my point of view. I do remember that there, some of the older practitioners would, we would manage from home, yeah. which blows my mind. You <laughs> yeah. know, um, Could never do that. I, yeah. I mean, I was just too nervous. I was yeah. in the hospital. There'd yeah. be nobody there, yeah. and I'd be in my little prison cell of a yeah. call room right. because you just in my mind you just don't know what's going to roll in right. the door right. and if I'm home and I have to come in I'm going to total myself in my car because I'm going to be so nervous about yeah. it but there there was that time and that that has changed completely yeah 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 and patient management if we take a problem and you know early in your career normal vet, you know, normal obstetric patient, you would have how many visits? Would they have an ultrasound all the time? How many? What other testing would you do just when you started? Can you give me an idea regarding that? Certainly. At the very beginning, uh, there was a time when physicians were proud not to have had a single ultrasound throughout mm -hmm. their entire obstetrical patient mm -hmm. care uh, through the nine to ten months of care. That changed fairly quickly, and um, early on in my career, the trend was toward a single ultrasound in the probably middle of the second trimester, around 20 weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And then that began to change 
uh, with more prenatal diagnosis. And once genetics came into the, the scene, then it got very, very different. Um, at the same time, the lawsuits were beginning to go up mm -hmm. in terms of missed genetic diagnoses. Um, patients did not wanted the opportunity to decline having a child with Down syndrome, for example. So early on, we did the good old quad screen to screen for Down syndrome mm -hmm. and spina bifida. A blood of course. test. A yes. blood test, the, mm -hmm. a, the old AFP, which of right. course had a lot of false positives and mm -hmm. et cetera. That was one of the first things. And then of course, if that was alarming, then you moved on to an ultrasound. And an amniocentesis. And an amniocentesis, which right. of course carried the risk of losing the pregnancy. Right. And um, then, in addition to that, the other th target, medical legal target, was macrosomia, mm -hmm. which later on in my practice led to the third trimester ultrasound. Mm -hmm. That was very controversial. Uh, there, I remember being, quote, in being in meetings with other providers and having quote, having been quoted a figure of about 30 percent inaccuracy with that third trimester sure. ultrasound. And again, that's what the literature states. I have to say that in our practice, we were much better than that. Mm -hmm. our, our texts were way better than that. They were mm -hmm. usually pretty close, mm -hmm. at least in terms of determining whether this was going to be a huge baby versus not a huge baby. Um, so that was another thing that happened. And the thing that really changed things was um, the uh, non-invasive prenatal testing, which is a single blood test very early on in gestation. Uh, and in addition to that, the early first trimester ultrasound to look mm -hmm. at nuchal translucency mm -hmm. uh, to identify the risk for Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And then, to, oh, then you got, in addition to that, you got your second trimester anatomic survey. If there was a history of a parental cardiac issue, you got a 20-week echocardiogram and in some cases the third trimester ultrasound. So between two to three. So a huge difference in the huge intensity. Difference. And yes. then uh, patients being monitored in labor, pretty routine for your whole career. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. Early on, as you say, they still remembered the Le Boyer births. They didn't mm -hmm. want any monitors. Uh, they wanted a warm tub. Mm -hmm. I, I do not have good memories of how those went. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and early on in your career, roughly what was your section rate? Early on, in, I, um, I remember being pushed to have a 15% section rate. That mm -hmm. was the plan. I don't know that ever ha if that ever happened. And towards the end of your obstetrics? Uh... It was probably 20 to 25 percent. Okay. And the reason for that is because the lawsuit rate was inversely proportional sure. to the C-section rate. Vaginal birth after cesarean? That got, that almost went out the window too. Right. As patients got more educated about, about that issue. Um, I did not have a problem with that. I was nervous about using high doses of augmentation uh, after that particular sure. scenario. Yeah. Um, and that was something that I felt I really needed to be in the hospital for. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, with regard to gynecology, um, you know, what constituted average GYN care for the normal patient uh, at the beginning of your career and then towards the end? Well, they would have a pap smear every year. They would, over the age, we used to do a baseline mammogram at 35 and then every year starting at age 40. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they had the annual pap smear counseling with regard to birth control, mm -hmm. counseling with regard to risky behavior mm -hmm. or STDs. Um, was there anything else there? Oh, um, some talk, some counseling about immunizations, fl particularly with regard to the pregnant ladies, flu shots, for example. Sure. And uh, contraception-wise, the options available when you were uh, just beginning your practice? At the beginning, we had oral contraceptives. Sure. We had injectables, depo-medroxyprogesterone acetate, and we had one intrauterine device. Uh, we had the, um, the copper IUD. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think, I, by the time I came on, no one was inserting Lippies loops mm -hmm. in some of the other ones, a Copper 7, although I do have experience taking those out. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then later in your career, present day, what sort of contraceptive options? We have long-acting reversible contraception, uh, some of which have desirable si side effects such as amenorrhea. Mm -hmm. The Mirena intrauterine contraceptive device has changed everything. Um, it's easy to insert. Many women like not getting a period. Um, it also is protective against endometrial hyperplasia. It's, it's just a great product. So we have that. Um, we also have uh, implants yeah. such as that are only a single capsule. Mm -hmm. The predecessor to that was Norplant. I'm sure you remember that. Sure. That was five, I think. Mm -hmm. It was either five or six. And there was no way to get the capsules in the same plane. Mm -hmm. I got real good at taking those out. Um, but now it's so much easier with uh, the, the newer single implant. Um, there, there are even things like the um, cervical cap. There, if patients want to do that themselves, the diaphragm is still around, although very ineffective. There's the female condom, which you can find nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, male condoms. Yeah. And there's even... Um, Fexi, which is a, a, not really a spermicidal, but an injectable gel that creates a, an unfavorable environment for And for options for sterilization. If yes. a woman comes in to you and says, I don't want to have babies anymore, yes. how do you approach that problem? How has that changed? That's changed quite a bit also. There was the good old tubal ligation, and every time that goes away, it comes back because the options, the alternatives kind of one by one have been removed from the market. Eshore was a, a good option. Um, I'm not sure that's even around anymore, but it's been pulled. Um, Eshore being? Eshore was those injectable nickel uh, You would do coils. a hysteroscopy. You would do a hysteroscopy, and then you'd inject these nickel coils into the tubes. Now, it wasn't effective for a good three months, uh -huh. which made it like a vasectomy in that sense. Took a while for it to become effective, but due to complications, it, it was pulled. Yeah, if if your plane of insertion was even a little bit off oh, yeah. center, it would perforate uh, the corner of the uterus. Sure, the tube. which is a really bad way to perf place to perforate. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Any yeah. other things that came and went, or oh, let me see uh, what might have come and went over the years. Certain forms of ablation. That's for menorrhagia, not yeah. For not for um, not for birth control. Um, trying to think. Besides Norplant, I'm blanking. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. And you know, as far as other problems go, you bring up another issue, and that is menorrhagia. Yes. Uh, the evolution in your management of menorrhagia, early in your career versus later in your career. Well, that's a big difference. Things have changed. Um, with regard to menorrhagia, we would try medical therapy. Yeah. At first, and that was almost always hormonal. Sure. And sometimes non-steroidal. Was it effective? Usually not. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, many of these patients wound up with hysterectomies. And certainly, not long before I came on the scene, um, almost every woman with menorrhagia had her hysterectomy. A hysterectomy mm -hmm. was expected. And I did my share of hysterectomies early sure. on in my career for, for menorrhagia. But then things began to evolve. There were much better methods uh, to control the issue, endometrial ablation being one of them. And there were various methods. Uh, there was the balloon. First of all, it was the Thermachoice balloon, uh, which circulated very hot liquid. I had damn good luck with that. Uh, sure. Yeah, it required patience. You had to get to the point where you kept the uterine pressure. But I had great luck with that. Um, overall, though, it was not a particularly successful method, and so that wound up going by the wayside. There was also the uh, hydrothermal ablation, which sure. Todd used to do, and that was also effective. But they were, there were limitations in terms of the upper limits of uterine size, et cetera, yeah. and uh, what would make it, uh, what would make the appropriate candidate. Um, so that changed things too. Another method that came on the market, and this one works fairly well, is a drug called tranexamic acid. Yes. Lysteta. 
it's, I have had very good luck with that. I don't, I don't like to use, I personally feel uncomfortable using it in a younger patient uh, for, for a chronic period of time because I worry about thromboembolic events. But as a bridge to menopause, yeah. it can be great. And I have found that a lot of women don't take it for the prescribed five days, one or two, and they're good. Yeah. And it helps quite a bit. But um, the other things that happened um, were other, the Novasure ablation has been very effective, efficacious, a radio frequency ab yeah. ablation. Um, and that's been very efficacious too. That's still on the market, that seems to work very well. There's also a cryo ablation, which I, no, I don't know anyone who does. Yeah. Yeah. So quite an evolution there. A lot of options that appeared during your career uh, aimed at avoiding a hysterectomy. This is correct. Aimed at uh, outpatient surgery and, and the like. Um, now, the other piece of this is how has your management of fibroids evolved uh, during your career? Yes, that's another one. Um, there are other options for that as well. Um, there is a sonographic, I'm forgetting the correct name for yeah. it, but there is a sonographic way to ablate these fibroids. I don't know anyone around here who does it, mm -hmm. um, but I've sent a few patients to one of the Boston hospitals and they've been very, very happy with mm -hmm. that. Another option is uterine artery embolization. Mm -hmm. um, and that also can be very, has been very efficacious in my mm -hmm. experience. Um, it does have a couple of drawbacks. Probably the biggest drawback is it does sometimes lead to um, some occlusion of the ovarian arteries and it can hasten the onset of menopause. Yeah. However, if you choose the patient properly, they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> They're fine with that. They're yeah. just yeah, as happy right. to have that. Are, were there any uh, instances early in your career or even to, to today where you would, as a matter of routine, say to someone, well, your uterus has attained a certain size, you should have a hysterectomy or Something like that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Early in my career, yes, I would say that to, to, to patients. Um, and probably for me, it would be 16, once it was in the yeah. mid abdomen, yeah. um, I would tell them, you know, that this is big, we really ought yeah. to take it out. But then I started getting a lot of pushback from patients as yeah. time went, more as time went by. Yeah. They did not want their hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. And it, I have a few of those patients to this day. They still have their uterus. Okay. They're doing just fine. Yeah. They don't care. They've gone through menopause. Yeah. They're doing just fine. Yeah. I would check their renal function. I would yeah. make sure that there was no um, occlusion or, or pr uh, right. pressure Hydro on the ureter. ureter. Yeah. But um, they're doing just fine, and yeah. that seems to be the case. Yeah, excellent. And uh, have you found that your uh, scope of procedures has changed during your career? perhaps with surgical procedures, perhaps with management of infertility? Were there cases you used to manage that you no longer do? Absolutely, yeah, that, that has very much contracted uh, mm -hmm. over the years, partly because I've gotten older, but partly because of the, the, my, the minimally invasive um, specialties that have emerged since mm -hmm. I trained. Uh, I can do a mean laparoscope-assisted vaginal hysterectomy mm -hmm. still. Um, but there's robotics now, and there are people that do this better than I, I can. So I stopped doing those procedures and referred them out. When and you feel that the robotic approach is better than the laparoscopic approach? I don't know if it's better or not, but that's what patients want. Mm -hmm. You know, it, yeah. it's well, a buzzword. Are, there are the billboards uh, on the expressways around here advertising them. This is, <laughs> this is, this is yeah. true. There's advertising, yeah. and patients are asking for these things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they kind of have to roll with it. I, I got to give them what they want, mm -hmm. you know, and. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, as, you know, I'll bring it up again, and that is that the issue of burnout seems to be, uh, at this point in time, um, headline news for the, the medical profession. And I'm wondering if you have any observations regarding your your personal career or what your philosophy is that uh, would uh, speak to that? I had my burnout. I had a burnout. Mm -hmm. um, and it happened, um, it happened in probably the latter 
certainly in the latter half, maybe the latter 60, per, 60 percentile of my career. And it was at a time when I'd been sued a number of times. Mm -hmm. And um, I had just had enough. Uh, the stress of being sued, I took it very personally. You know, uh, it, it was, even though intellectually I knew mm -hmm. that the things that the plaintiff's attorneys were saying about me, uh, the negligence they were accusing me of, uh, the bad doctor, I knew that wasn't true, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel it in here. So I had to get help. I got therapy. Mm -hmm. I got, I went, I called the Mass Medical Society and got in with a group mm -hmm. and got some therapy there. Mm -hmm. um, and it really helped. It, it, right. it really helped. And as those lawsuits receded in time, I got better, but it changed how I practiced. I practiced defensively. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up an interesting point here because, you know, as we speak, there is a movement in various quarters uh, dealing with early apology and acknowledgement and compensation for bad outcomes. Yes. Which involves not just money, but it, it involves communication yes. and a recognition on the part of both the patient and the physician yes. of a uh, human element to this Correct. whole episode. Yes. And, um, you know, the system that uh, you and I were processed through was exactly the opposite of that in the sense that um, you were advised not to talk to anyone. You were advised, you know, to admit nothing yes. and to acknowledge no, you know, nothing no that could be yes, yeah. construed negatively. Yes. Talk to no one. It, it was a recipe. It was a recipe for, for a lawsuit. burnout and yes. depression and Exactly else. right. Yes. yes. And, and so it was a system that uh, was not only expensive, uh, but from the point of view of harming uh, good practitioners who were practicing good medicine, it, 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 you know, was terrible. It was terrible. I hope, you know, in the future when people watch this, they'll say those poor people. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And that things are better now. Yeah, I, I wanted to quit. I mean, I think, yeah. I think everyone around me thought I was yeah. going to quit. I was yeah. really having a hard time. Yeah. Um, but I didn't. Um, yeah. And it got better. And, yeah. and so these days, you, you're happy to be practicing? I'm happy to be practicing. Um, I love mentoring young students. I, I, yeah. I really, really enjoy that. And, and one of the things that just, you know, kind of as a tie-in, I'll ask them, how are you doing emotionally? Yeah. You know, and uh, I make sure, I talk to them and say, and we'll ask them, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Yeah. Which no one ever asked. You know, I can remember being taught asking for help is a sign of weakness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I teach, you remember that, too. Well, you know, there's another aspect here. And that is uh, that there is a, a push and tug between medicine as part of your identity and a career versus medicine as a job and you have your life outside of medicine, you know, to be protected. Yes. And I, um, I wonder if you could comment on that. I think it's extremely important. I think particularly in our specialty, we have not done a good job self-policing on that issue. Mm -hmm. um, night call in particular, it's a, it's a recipe for getting, for fatigue, and everything gets worse with fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, I still think too many hours are being worked. Um, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a serious issue that needs more attention from the powers that be in our specialty. I don't know what the answer is. I think long hours are necessary in order to learn everything that we need to learn. There are only 24 hours in a day, and, and I think the push and tug here has to do with the demands of a private life. Yes. Which if you have a family and you, you have a spouse that has got a profession of their own, uh, then the ordinary activities of daily existence uh, uh, are expansionist. Uh, they, particularly if you have children, you know, the, the uh, care and feeding of children has also expanded as far as intensity goes. So there are those demands. And then on the other side, what I heard from you 
yeah. is, is that you need to feel when you are there with your patients, when you are practicing your medicine, you need to feel that you can devote yourself to what's in front of you. Yes, that's, that's very important to me. And I think, you know, it is that push and tug there. Yes. That, um, uh, you know, that is a problem. I, yes. You know, I'm, I'm, I guess as an interviewer, and I'm just putting my two cents in here, but yeah. I, I'm concerned that um, when people draw the line and say their private life takes priority over their professional life, that the demands of their professional life become so burdensome that they burn out. Yes. And, you know, if someone puts a priority on their professional life and finds that they're excluding their personal life, that that end of the equation burns them out. I agree. And, and you know, you have people who are either quitting medicine or getting divorced. Yes. And um, uh, it is, it is, uh, a balance that the, the nuance of which is is going to be a movable target for people. Yeah, that could be. Maybe it's a good thing that our specialty is splintering into subspecialties. Yeah, you know, well, I'm not sure how sure about that, but yeah. uh, but uh, you wouldn't be. <laughs> uh, so the other, you know, the other piece here has to do with not just the technology of your practice. Yes. But the technology of of uh, the office. Yes. Yes. And, oh, yes. Uh, you know, as we have this conversation, the electronic medical record looms large, and uh, the technology there differs. Yes. From mm -hmm. uh, you know the other technology. I you know we we are having a conversation, and you are clearly a person who is happy to adopt new technology, who has learned many new things during her practice and is, is not practicing medicine that you learned just during your residency. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're there to, to adopt new things. Yes. Talk about the electronic oh, medical record. I would be delighted to talk about <laughs> the electronic. I'll just tell you a little anecdote. Mm -hmm. We had a patient just this week. She hadn't been in five years. Mm -hmm. And we had a paper chart. Mm -hmm. My medical assistant rejoiced. <laughs> she, <laughs> She was yeah. singing. She's yeah. like, oh, pay I know where everything is. Look at yeah. this. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. So we don't have that anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, it's a mixed blessing. I, the, the electronic medical record is a mixed blessing. It had an exceedingly steep learning curve. I consider myself tech savvy. I found it completely counterintuitive, almost at every, at every juncture. Right. And I can, that, I think contributed to burnout amongst older practitioners because you couldn't do a simple thing like order a test. You yeah. had to be taught how to order a test. Everything, the technology made everything harder. It did, it did. For example, if you wanted to do a blood transfusion, yeah. you can't type in transfuse two units packed red cells. Yeah. It's emergency blood. I don't think that way. No yeah. one thinks that way. Yeah. And it's still like that. So you need to be taught how to use that record. Um, and I don't, I, one of the, the things that was difficult, I don't think there was enough one on one training yeah. to teach us how yeah. to use that tool. Yeah. Now we're, what, three years into it, yeah. and I'm more comfortable with it, but it took a long time. Yet it's technology that is basically writing things down in a paper chart was easier for you. So and ordering tests far easier. Right. Far so this is easier. technology that took took something and made it much harder. It did. It made it, that's exactly right. It made everything much harder. And if harder. you were to talk to a physician back in the paper chart days, yes, and say, "What do you hate most about practicing medicine?" They'd say medical records. And so they took the thing that they hated the most about medicine and made it worse. They made it worse. This is yes, that's a you you sum it up so nicely. And um, I, a lot of people left the profession when Epic was adopted. It's nationally, it is the top reason given for people either burning out or quitting. I understand that. I, you know, yeah. I understand that. But, you know, by the time it rolled around, I had enough confidence to know this is not me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew it wasn't me. I knew it. I knew it was the software. And, you know, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm, technologically inclined I, I it, my hobbies are oh, right you know that I know that stuff and I'm banging my head on epic and I'm like 
this is a bug. This yeah. is, it's not me. This is a it bug. Is, it is designed by people who don't understand how doctors think. No. Uh -huh. Who don't understand the workflow of patient no, care. No, no. And who, it is being sold to people who are in charge of billing and other things. The satisfaction and the efficiency of physicians is not a consideration. It is not. And my brother-in-law is a software engineer. We had yeah. him here when we introduced Ep Epic into the office, and he was shaking his head at the yeah. user interface. He said, this is the worst thing I've ever yeah. seen. And this is someone who develops software. Yeah. yeah. If, this, if, the, if, the medical record, if this medical record were being sold to patients, none of them would buy it. No, that's exactly <laughs> right. I'm like, yeah. I, you, you yeah. mean to tell me this is not a beta? This, this is it? <laughs> this is what we're getting? <laughs> right. Yeah. But oh well. So we've had a great discussion about your career, and and I think the important thing is is you're still here. I'm you're still, still here. I'm still practicing. And you're you're really ex expressing a lot of joy with your career. Uh, you know what? I'm in a really good place. Yeah. Um, I I have patients who still see me after 28 years, and I have finally learned that I'm important to them, and I'm behaving yeah. that way. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I'm I'm not planning to retire anytime soon. I am planning to retire, at some point. I have a lot of outside interests that I'd sure. like to in, indulge, but you know, I got past a lot of the hard stuff. It's hard yeah. stuff. I'm in a good place now. Yeah, yeah, it's terrific. A yeah. great interview. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me. Anytime, Dale.